that's his name? Uh, he's, he just happens to be served. Was it yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Uh, good to have you all this morning. I'm sorry I'm running just a tad late. <laughs> We don't have Brian Bond here at the church. It, it doesn't run as smooth. Sorry. We're just taking some prayer requests on the board right now. Quarantine. Quarantine again? Still. Oh my gosh. Who's got the COVID in your house? Uh, Brett had it. He's feeling it. He's been feeling better for a while, but we're still quarantined. I'm going to go and put Andy up here, my boy. He turned 17 and got his driver's license. Woo! That's awesome. Wow. Go, Andy. Pray for me. He's all grown up. That's right. <laughs> What color car is he driving? Put my brother up there too, my brother Bonnie. He just got ahead head uh, cold cancer. Oh, uh -huh. That's hard. And the country. Yeah. Some word of prayer and we'll get started. Father in heaven, we do praise you and thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for the golden sunshine, for Andy's getting his driver's license, and just for the opportunity to be able to come together as a church family and study your word. We want to lift up all the requests that are on the board, Father, and pray that you please intervene in the lives of these individuals that are on our hearts. We pray for the Holy Spirit. We pray for your healing touch. We pray that you please guide them. We ask for mighty angels of excessive strength to put a hedge of protection around them. And Father, we thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for this opportunity to have our prayers heard and, and answered. For we claim the promise of Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will answer you. In Jesus' name, we humbly make these requests. We humbly praise you. And we pray now for the Holy Spirit to teach us as we open the word of God. Amen. 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 All right. Let's see. I think Henderson is going to. I don't know if not. My fat head's in the way or not. All right. So we're in Daniel chapter four. And I thought we would uh, start reading there in Daniel chapter four. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth. So really, he's given a testimony even to us today, isn't he? Isn't this addressed to us here at Kingsport, Tennessee? I think it is. I think here we have a converted pagan king who's writing part of the Holy Scriptures here, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it's written for us today. Here in Kingsport, Tennessee. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar didn't, didn't even know about the New World back in his day, did he? <laughs> and yet, it's impacting us uh, here in our time, here at the end of time. Peace be multiplied to you. It reminds me a lot of the uh, salutations that we have in the writings of Paul. Uh, he also brings up this type of salutation. Whenever you're connected to the living God, uh, have this, um, I don't know, this burden on your heart for that peace that you're experiencing that other, that other people experience, don't you? Now, notice what Paul says, like First Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. This is the, the first or the oldest letter we have of Paul's. It says, uh, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, right in the first verse, right? And as we go forward, <clears throat> look at some of the other writings. Second Thessalonians, Paul writes, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then 
as we go through and we look at uh, uh, this first epistle of Timothy, in the verse 2, it says, To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So there is this. And, I, you know, have you guys experienced what I'm talking about? Right? Yeah? When you experience the peace that passes all understanding, when you experience this miraculous divine peace that we can't manufacture, that alcohol, drugs, or whatever other addiction maybe we have struggled with in the past, it doesn't even come close, does it? The peace of God. Notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 26. And I think it's verse 3. <clears throat> Some of you are saying, I want to experience this peace. I want to know this peace. Well, Isaiah 26, 3 is the key. If I can have somebody read that verse, please. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Lord, you will give perfect peace to anyone who commits himself to be faithful to you. That's because he trusts in you. Isn't that awesome? It's, I, I have it down in my Bible as a key life verse. And look how <coughs> Jesus addressed the same topic. How about in John chapter 14? We have verse 27. I think it's awesome that we have this really as a promise, isn't it? It's a promise from God. We can have this peace no matter what difficulties or what tragedies or what temptations that we may be encountering in our personal lives. We can have this peace. Right? Anybody have a personal testimony about how they experience the peace of God? Don? From the depths of hell, literally, is where I'm at right here, sitting with God. I don't want to talk to Don, you were the exact person I was thinking of when I said it was a testimony. Because, uh, you know, Don's been through some uh, tribulation in his life, and God has answered prayers miraculously, and he's experienced the peace of Christ. It can take you through these difficult times. It's not something we're just talking about. It's something you can experience. Isn't that wonderful? I think Hallelujah might work right there. What do you think? Oh, <laughs> 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 What's wrong with the rest of you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, notice, notice, notice this. And I love this description in Isaiah 66, verse 12. What does he liken the peace to? Does he liken the peace to just like a sip from a water bottle? What does he liken it to in Isaiah 66, verse 12? Well, it has something to do with water. What's that? That no hydrate water. Send peace to her like a river. That was wrong. Like a river. I mean, God isn't going to hold back, is He? Right. I mean, sometimes whenever we have somebody share too much information with us, we said, "Well, He tried to feed us with a fire hose." Right. God wants to share His peace like a river. <clears throat> river what? Amen. It is a river of life, isn't it? Amen. So Nebuchadnezzar went through a very troubling time, as we'll see here in Daniel chapter 4, and he came out of it with this peace that passes all understanding. He experienced this type of peace, and he would like for this type of peace to be multiplied to his people and his kingdom and us here, even in our time. I'm back in Daniel chapter 4, and I'm looking at verse 2, and it says, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. Does anybody think that's a powerful verse? 
I thought it good to declare what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in me. Right? A testimony. A testimony. God can work miracles in your life. I remember when I was in college and when I graduated, I um, had a tendency to, to drink alcohol and as a way to try to experience some type of peace in this world, right? To handle the stresses, even as a young man, uh, you know, getting a job as an engineer and working in, in uh, uh, you know, in the world, it was, uh, it was a, a difficult adjustment. So I noticed I started drinking more and more and more. And then one day I came home from a party and I wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I didn't even really understand uh, the Bible. I wasn't reading the Bible. I would have said I was a Christian. I would have professed that, but I didn't really know Jesus, right? So I came over from a party, and the Holy Spirit, I, I don't even know what the words to describe it, right, came upon me, and I and I called upon the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. He touched me in a way that I cannot fully describe and change me and took away that desire for alcohol. Amen. Right? And he can do the same thing with anybody in this room. Amen. We are called to be witnesses, right? Because notice what it says. This is this is another powerful verse in Revelation chapter 12. If somebody could read this, I want you to see in Revelation chapter 12 what it says about overcoming. This is verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Wow. You want to overcome? Give your testimony. Isn't that powerful? That's one of the components, isn't it? I'm thinking now of Mark chapter 14, verse 55, when it comes to this witnessing. Mark chapter 14, verse 55. We have somebody read from there. And the chief priest and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death. So notice this idea, hey, they sought witnesses. They sought people to give false testimonies about Jesus. So is there opportunities for the devil to use false witnessing, false testimonies, right? We need to be able to compare what we hear with the word of God to know if, we're, if this is true or something that's false. Because the devil also knows that witnessing is a powerful weapon that the church can use against the kingdom of Satan. And so he tries to use that weapon back. Right? And I think we got to be careful about that and use our weapon in a way that expands the kingdom of Christ. And notice what we're called to do. It says uh, in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus said to the disciples, and I think he's saying it to us here in Kingsport, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Right? You've experienced the gospel? It's almost impossible to, to shut up about it. <laughs> it's almost impossible to be quiet. Jeremiah had that experience, you know. He he was sharing the messages that God had given him, and he got to the point to where they'd been rejected so much by God's people that he got to the point of uh, he didn't want to share anymore. And Michael, he went through a hard time, you know. They were, they were kind of beating up on him, you know. Uh, verbally at least, and sometimes even physically, and he was just tired of sharing the message, right? But then and he had this living connection to the Creator, this experience with Christ there in the Old Testament that he couldn't keep quiet. What did he say it was like inside of him to try to hold back? What was it? A burning in his bones. Burning in his bones. Have you all experienced that? When he, he, he was trying to hold back. Because we live in a world that is against Christ, don't we? We live in a world that isn't in favor of Christianity. So when you're out there telling people what Jesus has done for you, expect the devil to attack back, right? 
But I tell you what, we can't hold back when we've experienced Christ in our lives. Charlene. Yes, I believe that when we give our testimony, it is like a shield. I mean, we have the shield of faith, right? And when we give our testimony, it reminds us that when we have faith, this is what God did for us. And it increases our faith again. It's like a mirror reflecting back and just going back and forth. And how many times do you give your testimony and you just get more and more and more excited? You know? Just, just really. Yep, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. Another wonderful verse in the Bible. And if anybody has the urge, go ahead and read verse 11. But verse 10, that first phrase, is what we're focused on in Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43, verse 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. And ye may know and believe me. That ye may know and believe me and understand, I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Look how witnessing helps us in our walk, like Charlene said, it increases our faith in the living God. So whenever you have opportunities to witness, take advantage of it. It's a great opportunity to glorify the Lord, to help somebody else in their walk with Jesus, and it also strengthens your own faith. You know, it's a win-win situation, right? It's the opposite of, of the tautological, what yeah, you call it again? Tautological. Right, yeah, it's the opposite of that, isn't it? Because that's when you got two negatives going against each other, right? Yeah. yeah. So back in Daniel chapter 4, we can see that as a result of his conversion experience, he's going to talk about here in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar wants people to know his testimony. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders, his kingdom is ever an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. That's the kingdom I want to be a part of. How about you? An everlasting yeah. kingdom? Isn't that wonderful? Kingdom that never ends? You know, the Bible says that our citizenship is where? In heaven, right? Our citizenship is in heaven. That's why we got to be careful when it comes to uh, things like politics or the things that we see around us, you know, uh, maybe in our own country or in this world. Because this is not going to be our permanent home, is it? Our citizenship is in heaven. So we shouldn't let things that are temporary on this earth divide us in any way. And the devil's very good about getting us riled up about things, right? Right? He's very good when it comes to special like the politics and things like that. I think we've got to, as church members, we've got to say, you know, my citizenship is really in heaven, right? You know, we're not going to have these two political parties and their their struggles in heaven. <laughs> this is something that's just temporary now. Charlene? I know, not for today. However, this week, <laughs> this week, um, I started to, whenever I was perturbed over <clears throat> something or worse or whatever, um, I would say, how does this measure up to eternity? And all of a sudden, it became so unimportant. And that is when I had peace. And it's like this week has been so smooth. You, yesterday, you would not have been, you would not have wanted to be me unless you kept saying that to yourself. Everyone was saying, "Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry." And I'm laughing. You know, I thought it was just hilarious the quote adventure that God was giving me in building my faith. Amen. Amen. Uh, I think we could sum up. Uh, verse 3 and say we should live with eternity in mind right we should live with eternity in mind that's the kingdom that we want to be a part of right is God's kingdom you know and the way to be a part of that kingdom is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ that's the only way he's the Lord of Lord and King of Kings he's the author and finisher of our faith he's the only one that can make us part of his kingdom right and what is our part? 
exercise our will, right? We exercise our will. We choose. And that's a daily thing to do. I could choose today, but I could turn away tomorrow, right? He doesn't force me to stay a part of his kingdom. But I have to choose each day. Every time a temptation comes, I have to choose, don't I? It's a daily choice. You know, and sometimes I think we have to say, and I think we can be honest with God, can't we? Can't we say to God, you know, I'm really struggling with this temptation, God. I, I really desire this sin, but I want you to change me. I want you to change my heart. Take away the desire of this sin out of my heart. I prayed that prayer before. Joy? We also have to choose good things every day. We do. I mean, like, I know I didn't drink water in the morning. And uh, when I first started this habit, uh, I lived where the water didn't taste good. And I would just say, I choose it. And uh, I drink them. And now, when I reach for the water, I'm thinking, thank you, Lord, for the water. This is the water of life. This is going to keep me going today. And um, I feel bad if I miss it. And But it is a conscious choice every time. It's not just to have it. And I think we should apply that same principle in our Christian walk when it comes to spiritual things as well. Because, you know, we can partake of the living water in the mornings. <coughs> You know, I don't always feel like reading the Bible in the mornings. You know, I, I maybe have something heavy, a task that I got to get accomplished, and my mind is kind of thinking about getting that done. I got, I want to jump into it and get going on it, but I've got to stop and I choose, right, to spend time in the Word. I don't go by my feelings. My feelings don't always line up with my Christianity, right? Sometimes I feel like a Christian. Sometimes I don't feel like one. Sometimes I feel like reading the Bible. Sometimes I don't feel like reading the Bible. What do I do in those situations? I choose to read the Bible. I choose to spend time in prayer. I choose to sing uh, songs to the Lord, since I know my church members don't want me to sing songs. <laughs> but somehow God massages it, makes it, you know, when the time it reaches heaven, I think it goes through a few filters, you know. <laughs> but I choose to do these things, not always because sometimes I have a strong desire to do it, sometimes I don't. But I know it's necessary, right? And that's what we have to do in our Christian world. We have to choose. Exercise our will. So I, Nebuchadnezzar, verse 4 of Daniel chapter 4, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. It kind of reminds me of the way that we want to live our lives here on this earth, don't we? I mean, who wants to go through trials and tribulations? I don't think anybody's going to raise their hand up because we have a desire to go through that, right? We want to live like Nebuchadnezzar was living, at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace, right? Well, kind of like what we're dreaming about living in heaven. We want to start it right now. Right, exactly. And I think... He was kind of living a situation that we kind of want on this earth now, isn't it, right? Um, whenever my daughter came to me in 2018 and said, uh, I want to go to the Philippines and be a part of this evangelistic outreach you're doing in the Philippines. I said, I thought to myself, I, I don't want to go through this discomfort. <laughs> I don't want to go through all these hours of flying on the airplane just to get there. And then to be so close to the equator, you know, and and uh, I already struggle with things being too hot as it is. And dirty. <laughs> yeah, and dirty. Wow. Was, is that where you stood in the water with an electric microphone? Yeah, that's where I stood in the water with the electric wires going through the very puddle I was standing in. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> and with these typhoons coming through. And I did not have a desire to go. But I chose to go. And I wouldn't change it. I'm so glad I did. Right? What a blessing. What a blessing to be a part of that. I didn't desire to go. But because of my daughter pulling me along, I went. And I'm so glad I did. It was a huge blessing. Right? And so uh, I, I think we have to keep that in mind. Uh, even though we want to be at rest here in our homes in Kingsport, Tennessee, in this area. But there's a ministry here. Right? We got to get out of the house. We got to we we got to get our feet dirty. We've got to we got to interact with people in the community and share Christ with them. That's what we're called to do, because we we are this isn't our home, right? 
Just a passing through. We're just passing through it. Camping. Yeah. Camping. Is that what you say? We're camping. So I understand. I don't want to inconvenience myself to go out and witness, right? And it shouldn't be something that you force on yourself. But God will open up opportunities for you to be able to witness to people. Because you're called by him to be in his army. He calls us, I mean, a soldier for Christ. Uh, Paul writes about this to Timothy. He's called us to do this. And so uh, so go through a little discomfort for Jesus. And see if you don't experience a greater blessing as a result than, than by just staying home and being comfortable in your house. I think we have to choose that, don't we? I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts of my head, I mean, thoughts of my bed, and the visions of my head troubled me. Kind of reminds me of Daniel chapter 2. So let's talk about where we're, where we're at in terms of chronology. So Nebuchadnezzar leads an army of Babylonians to Jerusalem in 605 BC, and they surrender. <laughs> Right, Daniel chapter one, verse one, it doesn't sound like it was very much of a fight, right? They see this massive army of Babylonians and the Jews surrendered. And it was God's will for them to do that because they weren't living in harmony with God's principles like they should have been. So God's chastising the nation is what he's doing. And he's using the Babylonian army to do that. So in 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar is leading this massive army his dad is alive at this time, and his dad dies in 605 B.C. So what he has to do is typically to go from Babylon to Jerusalem, you go along the Fertile Crescent, right? You have to go up from, uh, you know, Iraq and, and go northward, and then as you get close to Turkey, you start going then uh, westward, and then you go southward back down into Israel, because that was the way that the Tigris and Euphrates rivers ran, and that was called the Fertile Crescent, and people, uh, they could get food and supplies along that way. The shortest route was through the desert. And whenever Nebuchadnezzar heard that his dad died, he felt like he had to get back to Babylon, the capital of this massive empire, as soon as possible in order to establish his reign as the new king. So he went across the desert. So in 605 B.C., he, uh, after Jerusalem surrenders, he goes back to Babylon and establishes his kingdom. In 597 BC, the Jews had been not very good uh, uh, people of his kingdom, right? They've been misbehaving. They've been, they've been talking to the Egyptians a little bit about trying to get out of this situation. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar didn't like that, so he sent his army back in 597. And uh, so in 605, he took some people captive, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But in 597, he comes back again, slaps them on the wrist, right? Stat puts up, sets up a new king, the last king of Judah, Zedekiah. And he takes the man we know in the Bible as Ezekiel captive at that time in 597. Then in 594 is when we have the story of Daniel chapter 3. Now he's kind of backslidden from what he learned in Daniel chapter 2, which is 603 B.C. So now 594, Daniel chapter 3. So now as we're looking in, in Daniel chapter 4, I think what has happened next, if I can write these on the board here, let's see, 605 B.C., that's when uh, the Babylonians conquer. Conquer Jerusalem. 603 BC is when Daniel chapter 2 takes place. 597 BC, Ezekiel is taken captive. 594 BC is the statue in Daniel chapter 3. Then, believe it or not, uh, the Jews misbehave again, and so. Nebuchadnezzar sends his army back in 588 and besieges Jerusalem. And he's not going to tolerate this anymore. And so in 586, Jerusalem and the temple is destroyed. According to Wikipedia, the destroyer is a picture. 
So 586 BC. You can kind of see the chronology here. So I think we're probably looking at, because he says here that his kingdom has flourished, right? So we are sometime after 586 BC in Daniel chapter 4. Okay? We're sometime after 586 BC. I think 562 is when he uh, dies. Yeah. So I, I think we're sometime between 586 and 562. That's the range that we're in to give you some type of chronological context. So he sees this dream, and it looks like to me he would have remembered <laughs> what happened back in Daniel chapter 2 in 603 B.C., but uh, what does he do in verse 6? Therefore I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Well, the fascinating thing about this is they didn't try to pull the wool over his eyes this time, right? Verse 7, the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. Here's the interesting thing I've learned about that, though, that, that passage there. What, what happened in 603 B.C.? He has a dream. Nobody can interpret the dream. God gives the dream to Daniel. Daniel interprets the dream. And the king says, wow, Daniel, your God is an awesome God. Right? All right. Okay. Now, 594, he builds this golden statue in the plain of Dura. And he says, you know, he's backslidden, right? He's, he says, come and worship the statue. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't do it. They're thrown into the fiery furnace while he sees Christ in the furnace with them and says, wow, your God is an awesome God, right? And then he makes he, he, he makes decrees both times to people in his kingdom about how awesome God is, okay? Well, it looks like he's backslid again, Right? And he's not recalling that it's God who can give him the understanding of the dream. So he follows the same pattern he did here in 603. And he calls in the secular counselors about the dream. And then finally in verse 8, what does he do? But at last, Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar. That's his Babylonian name. According to the name of my God, you can see at this point in time, Nebuchadnezzar was back to worshiping a false god, right? In him, in Daniel, is the spirit of the holy God, and I told the dream before him. So you can see he, he's had this backsliding experience, right? So he, he backslides here, and then he, he backslides again, and here we are in Daniel chapter 4, and he's back to worshiping his old God. And then Daniel comes in. What's amazing to me is why can't we remember how God has, has saved us in the past? Why can't we remember how God has intervened in our lives and made a difference? Why do we have a tendency to go back to our old ways and try to figure it out and solve the problem before we finally come back to what we know works. You know, I used to say that, did that myself with the children of Israel. Why, why can't, why can't they get it, keep going straight? You know, why can't they stay on the straight and narrow? They have this pillar that they follow in the night or in the day, and then mm -hmm. and then the light over them at night. Well, what would make them forget anyway? And and yet we do it ourselves. Yeah, constantly. we're no different, are we? We have to be careful. If, if, if he would have been reading the writings of Moses every day, right, and the other prophets that Daniel had been sharing with him, if he would have kept his mind stayed on the word of God, I don't think he would have had some of the, back, the major backsliding incidences that he had where he's back to worshiping the false god again. And I think we had a comment way back in the back. Brother? Um, yeah, I was just thinking of um, chap uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, where it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, to see that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And so with Nebuchadnezzar, seeing 
the fourth person in the fire furnace, knowing that these people were with Jesus and, and he had seen evidences of, of God with him through Daniel. Um, maybe part of the reason why he backslid is because he had associations he couldn't, I mean, he had one foot in with God and one foot with the world. And yeah, yeah. He had associates as magicians, soothsayers, and whatnot. So he was trying to listen to all these things. And sometimes it's a dangerous spot. When you know it's right, stick with that and don't dabble with the wrong acquaintances, possibly. So, so from this short two verse passage here, I love what you said, brother. Because what, what it's teaching us is if you have one foot in the world and one foot in Christ's kingdom, the world wins out. It will pull you away from Christ's kingdom into the world all the way. The world, so you can't have one foot in each, right? Let's put both feet in Christ's kingdom. He can keep you there, right? It's not our job to save ourselves and to keep ourselves in the kingdom. It's Christ's job. Author and finisher of our faith, he's the savior of the world. He can save us. Can't, we can put our trust in him and he'll do it, right? He'll save us if we choose to go that route. So that's what I've learned from this short passage here. We can't have one foot in each because the world will pull us away from the kingdom of Christ. But at last, Daniel, at last, Daniel, <laughs> you know, Daniel's a prophet of God. Why didn't he go to the prophet of God at first? Why don't we go to the scriptures at first? You know, when you have issues and problems in your life, why don't, why don't you do a study in the scriptures? I, I, I really believe the principles of the Bible can be applied all down through time, right? And it can save us from making horrible decisions. I wonder if he finally called for Daniel, if the other wise men decided they better call for Daniel before he decided to have them all killed in order to be killed again. Yeah, well, let's go get Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel, Daniel, come help us. Yeah. <laughs> Joy? We just often want to do our own thing, but in Proverbs it says it two times, once in chapter 14, one chapter 15. Oh. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end there are the ways of men. Good point. Yeah, amen. That's right. Yeah, we got to be careful, don't we? And Daniel wasn't just going to go take over. Yeah, this kind of shows his character, doesn't it? It, it? Maybe, you know, that's a good point, Bill. I'm not 100% sure why Daniel didn't walk in when he called all the magicians and astrologers. Because he is, he's called the, the head of all the magicians, you know, later on in the text. So, I mean, he had to know that they were being called. Yeah, I wonder, was he on a trip, or maybe it just goes to show the humility of Daniel, right? Or, you know. He gave him a chance to go first, just like it was, or gave the false prophets a bail chance. Yeah, very good point, Joy. Thank you. Charlene? Right. You know, a lot of times we want to go and rescue people for Jesus, but it has to be their choice. You know, and sometimes... They have to come to the very end before they can choose Christ. That's a great point. Yeah. I think it has to be the Holy Spirit. I'm glad you mentioned that. <clears throat> I think that's what he's talking about here. He says, in him is the spirit of the holy God. <clears throat> Notice verse 9. He goes on to say, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians. So he's head over the magicians, right? Because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen in this interpretation. So twice in these two verses, he he notices that this he's something different about Daniel, right? The spirit of the living God is in Daniel. Notice, let's look at a couple of verses about this. I, I was thinking about... Being filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Well, notice what Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Where it is, where it is excess, but he fills it with spirit. This is an interesting 
way of him stating this in Ephesians 5.18. Be filled with the Spirit. I mean, in the Greek, the, the grammar that's here is very interesting because the word be filled is in the present tense. It's a passive voice. So that means the action that's being done is, is happening to the subject. So it's implied you be filled, right? So it's me and you. We're the subject. But the last part is amazing to me. It's an imperative. It's a command. It's a command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Kenny, you've been commanded by Paul here, inspired by God, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. All right? So so, so what do we do? Okay. I'm going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> right? He commanded the people in, a, in Ephesus to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he told them no. And how, how do we do it? Verse 19. Let's read it. Speaking to yourselves. So it's okay to talk to yourself. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And to me, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Yeah, that's a key, isn't it? Notice how the Holy Spirit is given initially. We go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Notice it's the, it's the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit's been poured out. Peter is preaching this fantastic sermon. And uh, it says that the uh, Jews, the men, they were cut to the heart, right? They were convicted. Notice Acts 2, verse 37. Uh, if we can read 37 and 38. Acts 2, 37 and 38. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I see a formula here. What, what do you think? Repent. In other words, you're being convicted by God that you need to turn from your sins, Right? I mean, we've all felt the guilt of sin, haven't we? We all understand, we have felt, this is the Holy Spirit touch our hearts and say this is wrong, right? And so what do we do in that situation? The Bible says to repent. Can somebody explain to me what repent means? Turn. Turn away from. Yeah. Change the direction. Turn. Larry said turn, change the direction. I love that. It is just like that, isn't it? We can do that in our lives. We can turn. When the Holy Spirit tells us it's wrong, and we can turn from whatever sin we're committing, can't we? It's like turn in a contrite spirit. In a contrite spirit. So in other words, we're not doing it on our own uh, strength, right? We're saying to God, uh, I have really messed up. I need you to help me in this situation because he's the only one that gives us the strength to turn. We're, we're here, You know, here's the thing. We're totally and wholly dependent upon Jesus. Even when it comes to repentance. Repentance is a gift from God. The Bible teaches us. It's a gift. Right? There's some people in the Bible sought repentance and God didn't give them the gift. It's a gift from God. You can't generate repentance on your own. It is a choice you make and the Holy Spirit gives you that gift. That's how you're totally and wholly dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice when you repent, part of repentance is 1 John 1, 9, isn't it? Yeah. So, yes. So, uh, the, what's that? Oh, you got to admit you're wrong. So, let's let's do 1 John 1, 9, a little louder and slower, uh, Bill. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Everybody should have that memorized. It's a wonderful verse, right? Whenever the devil's come along and said, you sin too much, you've gone too far, God can't save you. You just say, here's the response, right? All you got to do is quote the verse. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, part of repentance is you're confessing you did something wrong to God and 
God will cleanse you of that sin. Tabitha, he will treat you and me as if we had never sinned. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. I love it. God is so merciful and gracious. And so that's the first part, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent. Then what's the next step? Baptism. If you haven't been baptized, baptized, and the word baptized is, means to immerse, if you haven't gone through that process, then the Bible says, do it, right? Repent, turn from your sins, and then be baptized. Uh, and then what's the result of that? Notice what it says in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 um, Paul went across a group in Ephesus. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized it with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people they should believe on Jesus who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now notice verse six. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Whenever we have a baptism at this church, I call the elders up after the baptism on the platform. We lay hands on the, person who had just been baptized, and we pray for the Holy Spirit to fill them. It doesn't mean they're going to, you know, they could uh, speak with tongues and prophesy. They could do that, right? Prophesy means you're proclaiming what the Bible, what the Word of God says. So, I mean, you, you that's the basic meaning. I'm looking at people who could be prophesying, right? Proclaiming what the Word of God says, right? And speaking in tongues, well, I mean, you use language to do that, don't you? Right? Some of you know multiple different languages. Right, Roberto? Right. Well, how many of you know now? Five or six? Or... <laughs> Does Pig Latin count? I don't know. I guess, I guess not. Okay. And so, <clears throat> what's amazing to me, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to be sharing the, what your experience with others. It's back to that witnessing thing. So here's the formula in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. You want the Holy Spirit in your life? Repent. You want the Holy Spirit? Be baptized. You want the Holy Spirit? Then that's what comes next in this formula. John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Jesus has the encounter with Nicodemus. Or should I say Nicodemus has an encounter with Jesus, right? He comes by night. He wants to know more from this great teacher of God that Nicodemus recognizes that there's something special about Jesus. So he has this private meeting with Christ. Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So we must have the Holy Spirit in our lives and give us that change of heart, or we're not going to be prepared for an everlasting kingdom. So it's necessary to have the Holy Spirit, right? It's a necessity. It's a necessity. Um, you know, this is really neat. There's two different ways I can go here. We only got a couple of minutes, so let me see if we can cover both ways. Luke chapter 11. We're going to read somebody, please, verses 10 to 13. And if you're interested in being filled with the Holy Spirit, I want you to notice what verse 13 says. Luke chapter 11, verses 10 to 13. If somebody could read that with your preaching, your prophesying voice, and let's hear what the Word of God says. And notice what verse 13 says about receiving the Holy Spirit. Everyone who asks will receive. He who searches will find. And the door will be open to the one who knocks. Father, suppose your son asks for a fish. Which of you will give him a snake instead? Or suppose he asks for an egg. Which of you will give him a scorpion? Even though you are evil, 
you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So how do we receive the Holy Spirit? As, as people who have repented, people who have been baptized, you were initially filled with the Holy Spirit at the baptism, but on a daily basis, we should be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Because so remember Ephesians 5.18 it's present tense. It's a daily basis. Be filled with the Spirit, right? How do we? How are we filled with the Spirit on a daily basis? Ask him. Yeah. Ask him, right? You see the importance of prayer. You spend time with prayer, and you ask for the Holy Spirit. Isn't that neat? What do I have to do to receive the Holy Spirit? Ask. And doesn't it say that He will answer, right? Matter of fact, you remember when uh, Jesus, after he is resurrected and before Pentecost, right? He's so willing, and I want to use the word anxious almost, to give the Holy Spirit to his disciples, that he comes to the upper room, and the Bible says he breathes on his disciples and says, receive the Spirit, yes. even before the Spirit is poured out at Pentecost. Yeah. Is God, I'll tell you what, maybe I can say it this way. God is more willing to give us the Holy Spirit than we are to ask for it. God is more willing to fill us with the Holy Spirit than we are to receive the Holy Spirit. Why is that? We don't want to change. Because he doesn't want We're comfortable. He doesn't want us to be lost, and we struggle with, sometimes we don't want to change and let go of the things we know the Holy Spirit's going to tell us to let go of, right? We can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're commanded to be filled. Because it's not that God is trying to hold back the Holy Spirit from filling us. It's that we erect walls because maybe we don't want to go down the road of righteousness because we're being anchored by our sins or whatever we don't want to let go. Yeah. That's what Nebuchadnezzar, I think, was struggling with too. And each time he was pulled back into his old lifestyle. I think we have to be careful about the same thing, don't we? Pastor, Deep, don't yes. you remember saying that um, he would add the, the Israel's God to his gods, but he would never say that he is the only God. Right, he right, right. Add it to it. Yeah. So don't you think that that could have been a big deterring factor? That's right. That's right. Until this last event, right? Yeah. And that's what it takes. You got to buy into the whole thing, you got to accept God fully. A Christ fully in your life, right? It's called surrender. Okay. Oh, okay. Joy and then Charlene. This story, we find that Nebuchadnezzar is personally touched by God. Yes. Amen. Yeah, good point. In a dramatic way. Right. And we all can have that similar experience. Charlene? I guess, I think sometimes it's hard for us to get up the things that we really want to keep because we think that we need to be willing to do it, which is true. However, our job is to be willing to be made willing. Yeah. I like that. And that is yep. easier because then God makes it enjoyable mm -hmm. to be willing. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, Chris, we, we can go, we can go to God and say, I'm willing to be made willing. <laughs> I don't want to let go of this, but I'm willing to be made willing. I, I think that's an honest prayer mm -hmm. that God honors. Right. That's a good point. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, I tell you, before I go there, I want you to see something from John chapter 14, 16 through 18. Who is uh, the Holy Spirit? John chapter 14, 16 through 18. Okay, Bill said it's one person of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus says, uh, you know... It's not good to talk bad about God the Father or about Him, but definitely don't talk bad about the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> As a matter of fact, he says, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that's the unpardonable sin. So notice John 14, 16 through 18. Somebody read that, please. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth in the world. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, 
for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. What I see from this is a lot in this passage, right? I mean, this idea of helper, uh, one who comes alongside, Kletos, it is where we get para, where we get parallel. Uh, we have this helper of God who comes alongside. It says here that the Spirit God is the same as the Spirit of Jesus. That's what it says. Well, it, notice what it, it, it's interesting how he says, I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper, right? The Spirit of truth. And then he, in verse 18, says, I will come to you. So you see, he talks about the Holy Spirit. Then he says, I will come to you. He's equating the two together. Now, I do believe that the Godhead is three separate persons. I think we see that from Scripture, right? But there's this unique type of connection, a relationship that they have with each other. And we see a little taste of it here. He says, I'll send the Holy Spirit to you, Don, but I'll come to you. So when the Holy Spirit comes to Don, Christ is coming to him. So we invite Jesus into our hearts. We're praying for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, right? Notice what it says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. Notice the wording that Paul uses. 119. Notice the wording he uses. I want to say almost, uh, I don't want to say in place of, but uh, for Holy Spirit, notice what he says in Philippians 1.19. For I know that this shall transform my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, right? The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Jesus here in the Bible. So we invite the Holy Spirit. We're inviting the Spirit of Jesus, right? When the Holy Spirit comes to us, it's the same as, as Jesus coming to us. Uh, you see the same relationship with God the Father whenever uh, in John chapter 14, he's talking to his disciples and he's talking about the Father and they're like, well, show us the Father. And he's like, you see me, you see the Father, right? It's, it's interesting to see this type of relationship that we have in the Godhead. So when we invite the Holy Spirit in our lives, we're asking for the Spirit of Jesus to give into our hearts. And that's something we can have every day. Charlene? At the same time. And so the Holy Spirit now is Jesus with us, within us. Amen. Everyone. Amen. <laughs> yep, that's how he can connect with all of us at the same time. That's exactly right. Amen. So I think we can see here Nebuchadnezzar's experience. He sees uh, this type of spirit in Daniel the same type of spirit we're going to have in us. And so we're going to have to pick it up next time in Daniel chapter 4, verse 10. And we'll have a short word of prayer as we close. Father in heaven, we do praise you and thank you and claim the promise of Luke chapter 11, verse 13, that if we ask for the Holy Spirit, that you will answer. So we pray for the Holy Spirit to fill each one of us, that the Spirit of Jesus comes into our lives. We surrender our hearts and our lives to Christ and pray that he comes in and changes us. And we're willing to be made willing, Lord. There's some things that we're struggling with letting go, but we're willing to be made willing. And so, Father, we pray for the spirit of Jesus to enter each one of us even now. Transform us, prepare us for the second coming and for heaven. Help us live with eternity in mind and help us witness for you. In Jesus' name we thank you and pray. Amen. All right, thank you for attending class today. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.